Yeah, my name is Alexander Gersimenko. Uh, I'm a PhD student at the University of Westminster. And uh, I'm doing my PhD on political activism on the internet. This topic is kind of sub-product of my research. And it's about uh, elections in Belarus. But this is how they often look like if you travel to Belarus from the Soviets. This is a typical point where the candidate tries to talk to people, engage with them on streets. It's about one month before the elections. And I'm going to talk about par 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 elections to the parliament that uh, took place in September 2016. So basically, uh, I was in Belarus one day and I just uh, met a candidate and asked him, how can I uh, reach you? How can I talk to you? Do you have any representation online? Do you have a website? Do you have a social network account? He said, no, but I have an email. And you can email me, and maybe my assistant will answer you. So I was pretty surprised, and I uh, should note that uh, this candidate won the elections. Well, he became an MP, and now he's in parliament in Belarus. Um, why does it matter? Uh, probably you noticed that recently there were a lot of talks about the online campaign, uh, political campaign during the elections. For instance, latest elections in the US brought some interesting results, and many people talking about fake news, for instance, and how they've been using during the elections. Uh, Twitter turned to be sort of political spectacle, while big data seems to be quite important instrument and tool into engaging with audience. But does it matter in Belarus? I think it does, especially recently. The audience of Belarusian websites, especially social media platforms, grew extensively. It became very big, and com especially comparing, for instance, for what was how it looked like five years ago. So nowadays, it's not just young people who use social media. This is the audience of uh, main social media platforms in Belarus over just one, one month in December of 2016. And you see that people, it's combined one, so, but you see that it's not just young people or adults who communicate on social media networks. It's also people after 45, even 55 years old. And it's not just Minsk who, or Minsk citizens who engage with social networks, it's also people all around different cities in Belarus, and for instance, Homer, you, you see that it's actually the second largest city in Belarus. But the audience of some social media, like, for instance, uh, even Facebook or Twitter, is two times higher than audience of uh, the same social media in, the, for instance, Rodman. In, it actually also can explain things we are observing recently in Belarus those protests against unemployment tax. You probably noticed those who following events in Belarus that the second largest protest after Minsk took place in Roman. And I think it has something to do with social platforms. It doesn't mean, I don't say that social platforms immediately uh, turn into any sort of political participation, action, protest, not at all. But what we say that, uh, because I'm coming from uh, Political communication perspective and social movement science. This, this discipline is saying that those social media platforms provide something called affordances, potential to use them for political purpose, to engage people, mobilize them, and make political actors use various windows opportunities. Well, of course, uh, Belarusian, uh, Belarusian media, especially traditional media, is very much controlled. Radio, TV, all governmental control. Uh, Internet is a bit different story. Quite curiously, Belarus, one of few countries, uh, quite consolidated authoritarian countries, that almost did not try to block anything on the internet. Government blocks TOR, TOR, quite popular way of avoiding censorship on the online, but it does not block almost anything else except few websites. So. At the same time, um, um, in Belarus, yeah, we're observing thing that uh, uh, 
while not many people try to research at all how internet is used for political purposes, uh, all around the world authoritarian regimes uh, adapt internet more and more, not just to control it, but also to manipulate over the political discourse and political protests in different places. And my question was whether Belarusian politicians use this internet, for instance, during the political campaign, whether they try to talk to people, those who are online, and it seems like a lot of people online, so my expectation would be that candidates during the parliament elections would go online and use platforms in order to, well, at least reach people, maybe talk to them, potential voters, as potential voters, maybe get some feedback on their policy proposal. So what I did, I just tried to imitate kind of pot potential behavior of voters. Go on social media and just type names of those politicians who are running for elections and try to find them, whether they are there or not. And if they are there, how they look, what is their representation. Uh, I use, uh, well, yeah, and of course, uh, it was, as I noted before, the last parliamentary elections that brought quite interesting results. First time in many years to supposedly opposition politicians were included or selected rather than elected to the parliament. Why selected? Because, well, many people agree that probably we don't have free and fair elections in Belarus yet. Still, and interestingly, two of them were women. That fascinates me even more. Uh, but it doesn't uh, concern my current topic. So. I did just sort of the sort of search for candidates. Um, I did it for two regions: Vitebsk Oblast in Minsk city. In general, it was 118 registered candidates, and uh, I tried to compare their representation with civic campaigners, two prominent, interesting civic groups that were quite active during the election time, election period. Well, civic campaigns apparently were quite. In engaged with those platforms. They were very active. Um, they knew how to use them, though they mostly used Western media platforms. When I, talk, when I refer to Western, I firstly talk about those that are owned by uh, Western capital rather than Russian capital. So in Belarus, VK is the most popular social media platform, but it's owned by Russia. Russian uh, <coughs> company, the same goes for Odnoklassniki, which is one of the most popular platforms, it's also owned by Russian capital, and those activists mostly use Western, like Facebook, Instagram. What about, uh, what about uh, candidates? That's how typical page of the candidate to the Belarusian parliament in 2016 looked like. <laughs> Seven days before the election day, the candidate posts very nice picture of Squirrel. <laughs> Is it political? I don't know. Well, but... Uh, uh, it seems like, um, it seems like uh, she actually you know, used to be independent. So she does not run for, 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 from any, for any opposition party. Um, only 15% of those candidates registered in two regions. And it's, it was similar for two regions. Only 15% 15 of, 15 of them actually campaigned. And they were mostly young people living in big cities and apparently it seems like used social media platforms every day. So they just seems to have switched from this everyday use to their political use. Uh, and unfortunately, none of them had a lot of knowledge about how to use those platforms, especially when it comes to political purpose. So this is, for instance, the candidates from uh, opposition socialist party page. And if, you can see how he struggles with one of the pictures of him trying to post it again and again <laughs> and again and finally he succeeded but he forgot to delete all, the, all of his previous attempts. To those, who you, all, 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 those of you who know or who use social media, it's Facebook. You probably understand that it's not easy but, well, with time you can understand that it's probably possible to use them more effectively. At the same time, I identify quite interesting group I call radical politicians. Those people who are more, who are more much, much more engaged. For instance, this is the uh, Instagram thread 
It's not selected. It's how it looks like if you just uh, download it from the desktop. Uh, July, some 16. You see a lot of vignettes. I found a lot of vignettes who used to be the vice chairman of Movement of Freedom at that moment. He was very active, for instance. He occupied almost all space uh, on the social media, but yeah, he was not registered by the authorities. And you know why? They said that he was too active. Too active. And not just him. Lech Betzka, for instance, who did not run also, he was also very active on, on social media. And many others uh, never, never ever uh, run, but very active still. So, at the same time, that's radical, have a full profile, like this candidate. Also, seven days before elections, <laughs> very political message on VK saying, uh, don't wait for miracles, mi make miracles yourself. Well, he supposedly lost. Uh, yeah. But interestingly, uh, those who won elections, and again, they almost never campaign. Only two out of uh, several, uh, two 20, uh, 30 candidates that were selected from my sample, uh, only two of them had sort of representation online and were very active during the elections. One of them were former sport star, so he just engaged with his old audience, or previous audience, and the other one was from Chamonix, apparently, which is not the most successful region of Minsk, but <coughs> she was very kind of prominent on BK. So the rest, and all of them were pro-governmental, so the rest did not campaign, and the position candidate did not campaign at all, and those two of them who won. Um, so we, you can see that many candidates during these parliamentary elections approach digital space as formality, demonstrating little interest, knowledge, and eagerness to use those platforms in their own advantage. Um, and it seems that those social media platforms still should be discovered by politicians, which are already largely done by the activists. And the last thing, if you want to hear why, why it happens, well, first of all, why not why to avoid the campaign? Uh, different studies around the world say that uh, maybe people say that there is no elections in Belarus. Uh, maybe you, they don't have enough knowledge and uh, resources to campaign online, or they try to control their reputation. It also goes for security concerns, especially with Russian-owned uh, platforms and exposed to the personal social networks. Um, and if you, again, finally, when it comes to radicals or more engaged uh, politicians against those who were more mainstream, I would say that people who could be considered more radical in terms of disengagement and uh, prominence, uh, they normally do like this. It's they who mostly start this sort of engagement, political engagement during the political campaigns online, and later on, other, other sort of political actors join. So, in the future, I probably you will see a lot of cases and, uh, of uh, political engagement by politicians in Belarus, and you will see a lot of them finally join social media platforms. But I don't know when. Thank you.